But the important thing is, after service on August 8th, we're going to have an interest meeting. So you can sign up. Hopefully next week it will be up on Wednesday night. But more importantly, if you would like to go on that trip, come to the interest meeting on August 8th, and we'll go over details and how that's going to look for those four days. And so that's the main announcement. You can look through the, the bulletin for the prayers and just the other needs that are going on within the church. But so just, I just want to note this morning that a big thank you for all those that came out and helped with VBS yesterday. It was awesome. We had just over 30 kids, and they had a blast for four hours. They learned about confidence in Christ. They got to eat really good food. They got to hang out with awesome small group leaders. They got to sing. They got to dance. They got to eat snow cones. They uh, got to run through an obstacle course. It was just an all-around great day. I just want to extend a huge thank you to Goldie, first and foremost. She is kind of the, the mastermind behind that. She came in. She came up with the lessons, assigned people to small groups, and it just worked out really good. And there were a lot of other hands that helped as well yesterday. Carrie helped decorate and Gloria and several other ladies helped get the fellowship hall set up and food dispersed. It was just a really good day. But another big shout out just to plug these guys because they supported us yesterday. Marco's Pizza just opened up just up the street next to Dunkin' Donuts. They provided food, free food for 75 people yesterday. And uh, they're also extending uh, the opportunity today. If you take your bulletin by or if you just say, hey, look, I'm with Bragtown, they'll give you 10% off your order today and 10% of your order is going to come back to the church. So just again, they just opened up and are looking to establish relationships within the community, and they reached out to me just by God's happenstance earlier this week and said, hey, look, we want to partner with you guys. How can we do that? I'm like, well, hey, look, we're having BBS Saturday. They're like, awesome. How can we help you? I was like, well, we need to feed a bunch of kids and volunteers, and they're like, yes, we'll do that. And so if, you, if you're looking to get pizza today or sometime this week, go by Marco's. And if you happen to ask for um, Patrick, who is the manager of that location, just tell him how much – Ragtown appreciated uh, their support uh, yesterday for VBS. Also, note in your bulletin uh, the catechism for this week and um, the opening verse. I'm not going to go over that today because we've got several other things going on. But Leah also wanted me to share with y'all that, again, thanks to Bragtown's support, they fed 205 families this past Wednesday and hit 70,000 meals since COVID started. So, the fact that we support them, that we allow them to use our space and then walk alongside of them in prayer and in volunteering, their outreach is just uh, hitting uh, outrageous levels, in my opinion. And it's only by God's good grace that that is happening. So continue to pray for Leah, pray for the Hispanic congregation, the clothing closet, Summit, uh, the chaplains, all those ministries that we support here. And we're going to talk about that as we look at stewardship today. But before we go any further in our service, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, so much for loving us, for caring for your children. You are a God that is compassionate, a God that is loving, a God that is empathetic, a God that sees us as created in your image. And now, Lord, we do a lot to go against your image. We are a sinful people. We often can be hard-headed. We can, we can falter in our own flesh, but you love us in the midst of that. You forgive us. And you gave us the ultimate sacrifice in your son, Jesus Christ. And that is why we are here to worship today. Let us rejoice. Let us sing with voices united because we have one common love. And that is in you, Jesus. Fulfill um, just that calling on us today to come and worship. Make us alive by your spirit and rejoice in your goodness. But as your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name, Prince of Peace, mighty God.
men may be seated. And again, like I said, we're going to, instead of having an offertory prayer today, we're going to start doing communion on the fourth Sunday every month. Communion is such an important time for us as believers. We just sang a song about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and we are here to worship King Jesus. And communion is just a reminder for us as believers to recognize the extreme sacrifice that Christ did.
Love that little up the end. That's very nice. Let's stand now as we turn. Well, I'll, I'll turn into my hymn book, but you can just stand and we'll sing. Let us break bread together.
Great job, choir. If you will, church, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Let us go to the Lord in prayer first. Thank you, Father, for blessing us with so much. Help us to see in your word today our call as believers to be good stewards. Your word promises that you are going to return and take account for what you have given us. Help us to be mindful of that as individuals, but also mindful of that as a church. Challenge us. Just as communion should challenge us to reflect back on the gospel, that we have been given such blessing. Help us to think about how we steward that way. Help us to reflect on the power of your word today, moved by your Holy Spirit. As we pray, as we study, let us look towards you as the one that will bring it to fruition. Help us to trust you and expectantly wait on you, Lord. It's in your name I pray. Amen. So as we dig in, dig in to chapter 25, we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 30 in a parable that many of you have probably heard before, the parable of the talents. And so let's jump right in to verse 14. For it is just like a man going on a journey. He called his own slaves and turned over his possessions to them. To give to one he gave five talents, another two, and another one to each according to his own ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately, the man who received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man who had earned two, earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. Look, I've earned five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many more things. Share your master's joy. Then the, master, or then the man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. Look, I have earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Then the man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a difficult man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. Look, you have what is yours. But his master replied to him, You evil, lazy slave. If you knew I, re I reap where I hadn't sown and gathered where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers. And when I returned, I would have received my money back with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw his good-for-nothing slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a powerful, powerful parable, a very challenging parable. As we start this morning, I want you to take just a second and reflect on what you would consider as your most prized possession. Right now, here and now, what is the most prized possession that you have? For me, I think back when I was preparing this message, I thought back to the time when I had a super sport drum laser. It was the first part that I joy when I drove it, or let me say I found happiness when I drove it. However, I did not like filling the gas tank with premium gas when gas was $4 a gallon, and it soon led me to get rid of that vehicle. When I was younger, my baseball cards were my prized possessions. I had them, I looked through them every day, I sorted them meticulously, I scanned the price catalog to know how much they were. Eagerly every month, I looked forward to my Beckett. Uh, coming to me in the mail, which told me how much my cards were valued at that time. It was something that was ingrained in me as a young child to value. 
but also my family. For some of you, it could be something different. It could be your job title. It could be your bank account. It could be your retirement account. There's many things that we now possess that we value. And a lot of times, we take those things and raise them to a very high standard. We obsess over them. We meticulously track those things. We uh, spend a great deal of time and energy around those possessions. And they take away from our focus on God. And I want to challenge you this morning to think differently if you don't already. As we think about our most prized possession, do we consider our salvation as that most prized possession? Are we thankful to Jesus Christ who gave his life that we may have life? And do we value that above all else? Do we value God's kingdom above all else? Seeing the lost come to hold that that possession of salvation in their hand. The joy that we can see when a dead man is made alive above the, the good news of the gospel. Do we value that as our treasure? I want you to think about today as we talk about the treasure we have. Are we being good stewards of that treasure that God has given to us? So uh, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm taking notes and I'm, I'm plotting out how I'm planning this message and got my iPad in my lap, and I was just curious, and so I said, hey, Siri, tell me what stewardship means. So Siri, being the kind lady that she is, spouted off back. It is supervising or taking care of something, such as property. I don't know what I would do most days without, hey, Google or Siri or Alexa. They answer a lot of my questions. They entertain my kids at times. They play music when I need them to. They can cut on lights. And so Siri provided this definition to me of Again, supervising or taking care of something such as property. That is what stewardship is. And many of us, I think, forget that we are called to be stewards of what God has given us. So Jesus here in this parable wants to relate this to those that are listening. He has spent the part of, of chapter 24 of Matthew talking about the end times and reminding people that, yes, I will be back. I will return. And when I return... It is going to be a different kind of return. I came first in the human flesh to save, sacrifice my life for redemption for you. But when I come back, there's going to be a time of judgment. There's going to be a time of declaring those that are righteous because they have faith in me and those that are condemned because they rejected me. We must remember that. We must think about that. And we must recognize that as believers in Jesus, Jesus has giving us things to steward. And he is going to come back and kind of take account for that. Just like we see in this parable, there is a master who has gone on a journey. He leaves. He's like, look, I am going away, and I'm going to, to give you things to steward, things to take care of. And when I come back, I want to see how well you've done it. And he has his three slaves or his three servants, as many of your translations probably say, Five, two, and one talents. And it's money in that day. It's a form of money, a value of money. And for the one that received five talents, that's a large sum of money. But even receiving one talent is a rather large sum of money in Jesus' day. And they are given responsibility over that. Jesus says, look, I will come back. I am going to return. I can promise you that. And I need you to do something with what I'm giving you. And so we see the, 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 the results of those three men. One of them, the first two double what they've get, been given. One makes ten and one now has four. And then we see the other servant who goes and buries his money. And so we have to ask ourselves that God has given us things just like he has given these servants in this parable. We are called to be stewards of what God has blessed us with. And again, he says we're all different. We're all equal talents, and each of you are going to be given different things. And each of us, I can look out over this congregation and see that we all have different things that we are called to steward as individuals by God's grace. And we must remember that, that we are called then to be fruitful servants of what God has given us. We are called to, be, uh, to make much of what he has entrusted us with. We are not called to sit on it and do nothing with it. And out of our understanding of the gospel, and that's what I think that, again, God kind of ties this all together. 
We did communion and reflected on what Jesus did for us. Buddy this morning handed out a sheet to us this morning of our kind of financial situation we're in at this time of the year at Bragtown. And as we reflect over the gospel, as we reflect over Jesus' goodness into us and to our lives, that should naturally breed good stewardship. Because as we reflect on the gospel, as we live on the good news of salvation, as we understand the grace and mercy that's been shown to us, that should change how we view the world around us. We are not called to look at our possessions and our jobs and our family, uh, any other thing that surrounds us from a worldly perspective. We are called to approach everything from a biblical perspective, a gospel perspective that is contrary to how the world says we should handle everything that we have been given. The world will tell you everything that you have, you have earned. You have done things to get. And now it is your time to enjoy those things that you have earned. But from a gospel perspective, from a believer's perspective, we must look at everything as a gift from the Heavenly Father, entrusted in us for us to steward. That means our houses, our cars, our families, our children, our church, are all things that we have been entrusted in by God. And we can look at this parable, and we can decide how we want to steward those things. We can take those things and rejoice in those things and understand that God is a God of blessing that loves us and has given us out of his goodness, that he wants to watch his children multiply those things that he has given us, to celebrate with us as we treasure the things that he has blessed us with. That's our one option. Or we can take what he has given us and bury it. In essence, waste it. Do nothing with it. Anticipate that we can just give him back what he has given us to begin with. And we have a view of God that is not very appreciative. Like the gentleman at the last one that said, Look, God, I saw you as one that, does, that reaps where he doesn't sow. That you were a difficult man and that you gather where you haven't sowed seed. This young man did not understand who God was. This young man did not understand the gospel. For he didn't know that Jesus came to give and to give life in abundance. To give freely. That that is not a God that we serve. And therefore he mistake God. He mistook God for somebody that he wasn't. And so as we reflect on that, we must continue to grow in that discipline. That stewardship, that, that act of taking what God has given us and taking care of it. And look, we don't talk about, I don't think of the church, I don't think I heard much about it growing up, and, and maybe I did and just ignored it, but spiritual disciplines. And thinking about it, what it means to be spiritual disciplined. We don't like to be disciplined a lot of times. Discipline means that we go along with what we're supposed to do, that, that shapes us and molds us, and oftentimes we don't like that term. I know my kids don't like the term of being disciplined. Discipline to them is not a good term because that means that they have done something wrong. But for us as individuals, we are wrong in our flesh daily. And so we must discipline ourselves to grow in Christ. And that means in various ways. That means reading the Bible on a daily basis. That means entering into prayer. That means at times fasting. That means to come and worship corporately. That means to serve like many of you served yesterday at DBS. But it also means stewarding. Stewarding is a form of spiritual discipline where we have to learn what God calls us to do with the things that he has given us. And how do we steward those well? One is individuals, but also corporately. And that's where I'm going to spend a lot of my time today is talking about us as a church. Oftentimes we look at stewardship from an individual level. We think, well, we're supposed to tithe, we're supposed to give, we're supposed to serve, we're supposed to uh, spend time with God, and yes, all those things are accurate. And we need to be growing our stewardship as individuals. But I want to challenge us today to think about stewardship from a corporate level, from a Bragtown level, from a church level. What are we called to be stewards of, and how do we steward what we've been giving here at Bragtown? Because that's what we are. Bragtown Church, we are stewards of what God has given us. And how do we do that? Well, I want you to think, for many of y'all, y'all have been here for many years. We have been blessed here at Bragtown. 
We have a wonderful facility. Y'all got our financial report. We are in good financial standing. We have people sitting in our pews every Sunday. And sometimes we might get uh, discouraged and think that we're small, but we're not. Many churches are struggling to have 20 people show up for service every week. And our neighbor church right down the street is in that similar situation. So be grateful for what, Brag or for what God has blessed Bragtown with. We were able to host 30-some kids yesterday with over 20 volunteers and share love and share the good news of, of trusting in Jesus. The confidence that comes in putting our faith in Christ. And that's what I encourage you to do, guys. It starts with confidence in a God that cares, a God that loves, and a God that has given us so much. We must walk by that trust. We must walk in that confidence, walk by faith that God continues to love us and cares about us. That's where stewardship breeds from. And as we recognize how much we have here at Bragtown, that should encourage us to walk in discipleship. First and foremost, we must disciple one another. We must be discipling ourselves and walking alongside of each other so that we can grow Christ's community, grow Christ's kingdom. We must grow ourselves and we must grow each other so that we may grow the lost. If we're not personally and spiritually growing ourselves, then we can never pour into the lives of other people. We have the opportunity to have God's word, to come in here and fellowship and walk alongside of other believers. Now it is our job to go forth and stewardship. That, that growth and that discipleship takes place here and steward it well in the community. We've been talking about who's your one. And that's what it's all about, is having eyes for the lost. Recognizing that all around us in the community are people that are in desperate need of that gospel message. Something that we have, that if salvation is truly your treasured possession, your most important thing, then we should be eager to share that with everybody else. If we truly value it, we should let other people see it and hear it. Man, I love talking about my trailblazers when I had it. I know you want to jump in here and go for a ride. Let me show you what this car can do. I enjoyed it. We must remember that, remind ourselves of that daily as we steward that message. And that is why we pray for our ones. That is why we engage our ones. That is why we invite our ones. Invite our ones not only to church, but into that relationship with Jesus. Continue to do that. That is the first step within our church as good stewards of the gospel, is that we disciple others to be a church that is growing Christ-like disciples. So are we doing that? Are we working to make more disciples? The next thing is that we must be ready to reach our community. And I have read some challenging statements that I'm going to let you guys hear today. And I want you to mull over these things because these are powerful statements when we look at the church. And it oftentimes reverses our understanding of the church and the community. I read recently that community is not here for the church, but the church is here for the community. Think about that for a moment. Events are not meant to get people into our church, but it is for us to get into their lives. How do we engage people through the church? How do we minister to the community? And to sum that up in one question is, if we took Bragtown out of Bragtown, would the community miss us? Would the community even realize that we were gone when we shut our doors? And in part, I said yes. Yes, they would, because this church is vibrant and active right now. But we must continue to be good stewards of that, to be good stewards of what God has given us. He, again, has given us a wonderful church, and it has given it to us not for our ownership, not for this church to be mine or Diane's or anybody else. It is his church. This is his community, and we must recognize that. It is not ours. And I am reminded, I'm not to, to, to throw this at anybody or any, anything. I just, I just want us to get this around our head. There's a list of founders out here in the vestibule. We're in the hallway out here. And that's great. We ought to honor our father, our founders of this church. But it's not their church. We have pictures of our pastors up there in the fellowship hall. 
It's not any of their churches. Some of them might have done wonderful things in this church, but it is not theirs. It is not any of ours to lay claim to. It is God's, given to us for his glory. And as we start processing that, as we start wrapping our minds around that, we often, well, I say we always have to come before God and say, this is what you've given us. What do we now do with it? It is not mine to hold on to. This building is not mine to control. It is God's. And I'm just a steward of what God has given me, as are each of you as members of this church. Let us remember that. It is for His glory, not for our own glory. God's name should be proclaimed from this building. When people drive by, I want them to think, man, God is good. I see God all over that space right there on 30. 218 North Roxborough Street, man, God is active there. His, his spirit is there. He is blessing what is going on out of that church building and within that congregation. And we must remember, too, that partner ministries are so important in that, y'all. Partner ministries have come alongside of us, and we have done a good job. The history of Bradford has been wonderful in saying, yes, let us open our doors and see what God can do through other ministries. It doesn't necessarily have to be about us. As I look back on the few months that I've been uh, in this role since the beginning of March, we have almost added a partner ministry every month by being obedient and saying, yes, God, you have given us much, let us do much with it. Summit Church is worshiping here. The Hispanic congregation joined us. We are walking, walking alongside devoted disciples as they reach young men in Oxford Manor. But many of y'all have said yes a long time ago by having the chaplains come in, by offering Leah and Ignite a place to minister out of. That is why they were able to feed 200 people this week and have been able to provide 70,000 meals over the last 18 months because somebody said yes in obedience to what God has given you to be stewards to allow him to grow his kingdom. We must consider this. We must continue to have a desire to faithfully follow God. Sometimes we can get caught up in things that are, are worldly, that distract us from saying yes. Fear often breeds no. There's oftentimes we tell our kids no. No, you can't do that. No, you can't climb up on your boat bed and jump off of it. No, you can't run across the street without somebody out there. No, you can't. God is good, and God is faithful. And I tell you, God honors obedience. God honors what is blessable. And when I do marriage counseling, I might have told you all this before, but I tell my couples that God's not going to bless what's not blessable. In church, he's not going to bless a church that's not blessable. And I'm not saying that we're not blessable. I think that we are on the right track. We are doing things for God's glory, and I see movement in this congregation and in this building. We must continue to do that. We must walk by that faith and not by that sight. I'm reminded of what Jesus tells Jairus as he heals, as he prepares to heal his daughter. Jairus is the man, the, the, the church official that comes and asks Jesus, says, my 12-year-old daughter is sick. She's dying. Come save her. But on the way, Jesus gets stopped by this crowd and some mysterious woman who touches the hem of his garment and is healed. And so this is the distraction. Jairus is frustrated. Jairus is like, come on, you need to come. My daughter's going to die if you don't hurry up. Jesus gets done ministering to this lady and goes on and heads towards Jairus' house. He gets word on the way that his daughter's already dead. He's like, Master, don't worry about it. Don't trouble yourself now. And Jesus looked at him and said, don't be afraid. Only believe. Jesus is mocked by the people as he walks into the house and says, she's only sleeping. They laugh at him, but what does he do? He goes and raises Jairus' daughter up, brings death to life. We see that over and over again in Jesus' ministry, and we must remind ourselves that Jesus is capable of doing far more than what we believe he can. We must walk by faith and not by sight. We must not be afraid, but only believe, church. We must grab a hold of that as we witness to our one. 
Many of us are discouraged and are fearful about talking to, Jesus, or talking to somebody about Jesus. We're scared of the reaction. We're afraid that we're going to be rejected. We're scared that we might lose a friend. If you lose a friend over the gospel, I'm going to tell you it's okay. Because Jesus is far more valuable than his friendship. And if they want to reject you because of the good news you're trying to share with them, let it be. But Jesus is good. Jesus is merciful and full of grace. And he continues to show that. And this financial sheet is just a testimony to God's goodness within our church. But again, we must think in different terms as we look at our offering. Our offering is not given for us to sustain our needs, right? Now granted, we have to take care of ourselves. I hope y'all continue to pay me. Hope we continue to have lights and heat and AC in this building. Those things are needed. I get that. But the offering ultimately is to proclaim Jesus' name. And how do we do that? How can we better proclaim his name by the financial situation we find ourselves in? We have excess, church. We do. You can look at this sheet and see that. Are we going to be like that third servant that takes that money and hangs on to it, buries it in the ground, and hopes that we give God back what he gave us? Or are we going to step out in faith with that money and say, God, I want to follow you in obedience. I want to work for your kingdom glory. And again, this doesn't necessarily have to translate back into more money. The ultimate goal is to grow God's kingdom. Are we stewarding that well? Ultimately, that's how we measure success, guys. Yes, we have to be financially sound and make sure we can handle things. But ultimately, we must ask, are we growing God's kingdom with what God has given us? And part of that is using our money well. And there are several things that are on the table that are coming up that are being discussed by the deacons that cost large sums of money. And it might be challenging for some of us to say yes to some of those things. But again, what do we have this money for? And why did God give it to us in the first place? That takes the ability of walking by faith. And so as we wrap up, I want you to think again about this parable and how challenging it truly is. How challenging that, that it should be for us as believers. Because we are called to steward well and we see the consequences of not stewarding well. And that can be fearful. This guy, again, lacked faith and understanding of the God he served. The master that had given him that money. He did not really know his master very well. How well do we know the God that we serve? Are we digging in his word? Are we asking for guidance? Are we listening to the spirit? as we discern how to handle what we have been blessed with. Ultimately, the goal of stewardship for the church, again, is not to make money, not to build bigger buildings, or even preserve the past, but it is to see people receive and treasure salvation. If that is truly our greatest treasure, then let us let others treasure that treasure as well. That's what we should be striving for as a church. That is the result that we should be chasing after day after day, is to see more people enter the kingdom of God. And ultimately, guys, I've read this parable countless times. Many of y'all are probably familiar with this parable, and most often we highlight the start of verse 21 and 22. And I've missed this so much, guys. And I was, I was reading through this again this week, this hit me, that it is not about the beginning of that verse. Often we quote this as we try to serve God and we seek to hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's not what we should strive for. I mean, yes, that's good to hear. Who doesn't like to be encouraged or, or lauded with praise? But look at the last section of this verse, and this is where I want to end. Why does it say we do this? In order to share in your master's joy. Think about that, church. We get to share in the same joy that our master enjoys. As we steward well, God is finding joy in our obedience. And he says, look, come on and share this joy. Who doesn't want to share what God is doing to be? Let us walk by faith. Let us steward well what God has been giving, not so we get that praise of good and faithful servant, but because we, we get to share in God's joy. Isn't that amazing, church? Amen. That we get to share in our Creator's joy. Let us worship you in prayer. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to be in your presence, to be filled by your spirit, to know that we can rejoice in what you rejoice in. That should give us a new look of life. That should help us question our desires and our motives behind everything we do. Help us truly, truly treasure that salvation that you have given us. And then to take, a, take a hard look at our life. And are we stewarding well what you have given us as individuals, but more importantly as a, as a corporate body of believers? Man, I'm overjoyed to be here at Bragton. God, you have, you have truly, truly blessed this church with such a rich history. Such a rich group of people that love you and love this church and I truly believe love this community. Let us steward well by the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we seek to share that salvation with those around us. It's in your name I pray. Amen. And as Rich leads us in our closing hymn, I mean, if there's somebody here today that doesn't know that true joy of salvation, that doesn't recognize why we get communion, that has never accepted Jesus getting up on that cross and saying, I will give my life for yours. You can try to save yourself all day long, but you can't do it. It is only by my body and my blood that you can come to my Father. The altar's open. Come and pray. Let that be the day that you accept Jesus as your Savior. And those that know you, those that know Jesus already, reflect on stewardship today. Reflect on stewardship this week. Ask the Spirit to give you direction of how we as individuals do as well, how we as a church can be good students of what God has given us. Sam? Good morning. I want to thank everybody for being so faithful to this church. The church has been around for a while, and has many of us who are members have been around for a while. We really thank the Lord for Eric and his messages to us, which has just helped us to praise you and love you and give our hearts to you. And we thank you, Lord, that this church has been here for many years. And we pray that it will continue to be here for many years and that our members will just come and go every time they can and be faithful uh, 